is part of our human experience, but the way we fight it is changing. Technology is defining the future of warfare. It's changing the way we think about making decisions in warfare, providing capabilities that were previously unreachable. Lessons from the past inform the future. At every technological leap redraws the battle lines we once knew. Technology was once a spear. Today, it is a cyber attack. The amount of interconnected technology has fundamentally transformed the operational environment. Familiar domains grow increasingly complex, and the race to dominate the ultimate high ground has begun. In the same way we think about sea power, we need to start thinking about a strategy for space. As machines take the reins, the speed of warfare accelerates ever faster. Technology has always shaped war. Evolution has always happened in war and in society. It will continue to happen. War has always shaped humanity. Problem solving, learning, decision making, and consequence are inherent to the human experience. Yet modern war machines can mimic cognitive functions and remove the human element from the process. Masses of data inform algorithms, which in turn guide autonomous weapon systems to search or engage a target. As machines match and outpace human capability, the landscape of future warfare could be like nothing we've seen before. Will there still be a human element in future conflicts? Or are we destined for a future defined by artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, or AI, is a branch of computer science dedicated to developing machines that mimic human cognition. Machines that learn and solve problems. AI as it exists now is really just a deep learning pattern matching set of algorithms that allow a computer to train itself on data from the environment and then replicate that. We might think of artificial intelligence as computer chess. I believe it's absolutely crucial to find out at what level machine can copy the decisions of the human being. Robots on the factory floor smartphones guiding navigation. Artificial intelligence systems are incorporated into our daily lives. Artificial intelligence generally relates to um, systems that have been described as capable of imitating intelligent human behavior, acting appropriately and with foresight in the environment, and systems capable of applying human-like reasoning. From the age of antiquity to the present, the concept of creating intelligent machines has fascinated humanity. We are living in the fourth industrial revolution, an era in which technology is advancing at an extraordinary rate, where the digital world is enmeshed with our physical and biological worlds, where science fiction informs future warfare. One thing that it kind of always comes up in, in this topic area is whether or not the, the Terminator is coming. When you mention artificial intelligence, people go straight to the Terminator or hell from 2001, a space odyssey. The reality is we're just not there yet. Every form of artificial intelligence at the moment is what's known as a narrow AI that's capable only doing a narrow range of functions within the algorithms and the data sets that it has access to. In future warfare, an experienced battle-weary soldier with finely honed instincts will incorporate AI into combat missions, endowing AI with the same level of trust that they share with their fellow soldiers. You develop a trust in AI through practice and people are already getting that practice through their use of smartphones, engagement with platforms like Siri and Alexa. People are already very familiar with that and very used to it. Artificial intelligence, 
already part of our modern life, has exploitable capabilities that militaries are leveraging in the combat zone. It can do things over and over. It's very accurate. It never gets bored. It doesn't need to sleep. AI is most likely to be developed and incorporated in what is often referred to as the, the dirty and dangerous tasks in the military. On the battlefield, for example, removing wounded personnel. So those kind of functions that are, are dumb or dirty or dangerous are very, very well suited to artificial intelligence. Why take two, three, four fit and capable soldiers to carry one of the colleagues off the battlefield if that could be delegated to a, a robot of some kind that could pick up and carry that person away? So that leaves you with your other functioning soldiers to continue whatever attack or defense is going on. AI in many ways allows certain skills that used to be the sole domain of humans to be outsourced or taken over by robots. Throughout history, warfare has harnessed technology at every opportunity. Military organizations that stay rigid and tradition-based are left behind and less likely to be victorious. As we evolve through history, we see war and its character changing, and many of the factors that affect that change are the introduction of technologies. For example, during the American Civil War, the advent of technology to include the Springfield rifle, uh, the use of mass artillery, and really the introduction of military technology that was superior to tactics. You saw a definition of that conflict that was not akin to anything that had happened before. It was without precedent. In World War I, rapid developments in technology, such as the machine gun, facilitated the rise of attrition-based trench warfare, and early templates of tanks and aircraft began to reshape the battlefield. We all think about the trenches and how for, on the Western Front for you know, nearly four years, hardly anybody moved position and lots of soldiers died. And that was the reality. But towards the end of the war, from the middle of 17 into 18, mobility started to be restored. And that was because a combination of some new technologies were invented, but also existing technologies were used in a different way. World War II was a high-tech arms race that shaped the foundations of modern warfare. Radar, jet engines, space travel. Germany even produced a remote-controlled 2,300-pound anti-ship missile, the Fritz X, considered the first precision-guided weapon and the forerunner to the anti-ship missile. Each new piece of technology creates a momentary edge. It's up to militaries to capitalize on it. And artificial intelligence is shaping up to be the key to that next big edge. In the ancient world, mythologists wrote of automated machines. But in more recent times, it was Alan Turing, an English mathematician, computer scientist, and theoretical biologist, who emerged as the father of artificial intelligence. Turing's work on code-breaking computers during World War II, and later his hypothetical Turing machine, saw him closing in on what artificial intelligence could be. Turing's landmark paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, asked, can machines think? He posited that if computers respond intelligently to intelligent humans, then they should be recognized as possessing intelligence. Alan Turing had died two years before the 1956 Dartmouth College Conference. At that conference, the term artificial intelligence was first coined by John McCarthy. Turing's legacy lives on today. The golden age of AI research had begun. If we think about the history um, of the U.S. Department of Defense involvement with uh, technological developments, uh, we have to go back to the 1960s and 70s. The 1956 Dartmouth Conference is recognized as the beginning of the golden age which continued until the mid-1970s. But midway through that era, the US government was suddenly forced to recognize that computer science had to be a big part of the future. Back 
then uh, USSR launched the space satellite Sputnik. That was the first uh, space satellite. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The United States was very much surprised by this event. Nobody was aware that this was happening. As a response to that event, the U.S. Department of Defense stood up DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, with a goal uh, to essentially make sure that we would never be again surprised by an adversary in context of technological development. I shall propose a program of action, a program that will demand the energetic support of not just the government, but every American, if we are to make it successful. DARPA invested heavily in a variety of new defense technologies. Artificial intelligence, though high on their agenda, was just one of their many pursuits. DARPA created ARPANET, and that essentially led to the creation of internet. Other things that DARPA has been credited with is the creation of Siri digital assistant technologies. Another example is GPS. Much of the same technology used by militaries is also used in the public sector. The way that we use, say, Google Maps on a smartphone to navigate is increasingly the way that targeting decisions and intelligence decisions and command decisions are being made on the battle space. So you typically have a human and an AI or an algorithm looking at the same data and almost working side by side as they develop. But what happens when we remove the human altogether? One of the key capabilities dominating discussion around the future of AI is autonomy. Autonomy is uh, understood as something less sophisticated than artificial intelligence. It's funny, these terms are often uh, used synonymously, which I don't think is quite right. Artificial intelligence is kind of an umbrella term for the broad portfolio or, or constellation of uh, technology and techniques that are a series of sensors and processors that take information, process it, and give a output. Autonomy is a bit more of a philosophical term or a command and control term in a sense. It's the ability to operate independent of other control or guidance. AI-enabled systems allow for autonomous capability to exist. Autonomous weapons have been around for longer than many of us may be aware. Landmines, such as those used in the Vietnam War, are an early example. A landmine is fully autonomous. You bury it in the dirt, it has no more interactions with its creator, and it will just continue to do its function, which is actually to do nothing until the moment someone steps on it. A soldier's foot treads upon the mine, and certain parameters are met. The weapon is activated to catastrophic effect. When we think about more modern and future examples of autonomous weapon systems, the current definition used in international law is a system which is capable of selecting and engaging targets without human involvement. In order to do that, you need an amazing amount of, of recognition systems. There has been controversy around the development of such recognition systems, facial recognition, which could perhaps be used for nefarious purposes rather than perhaps a legitimate legal warfare situation. But in terms of recognition, that's difficult. And then there's a the targeting. Who ultimately decides that a weapon can be fired and another human being killed? Are you going to delegate that responsibility to a computer? I don't think so. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions about what AI and autonomy are going to bring to future warfare. It is a very exciting area and there's a lot of great potential, but it's sometimes bandied about both terms as a silver bullet for things that are just very difficult to do. And I don't think that's quite right. AI has been shaping the future of warfare for some time already, actually. For example, the Iron Dome air defense system, that is autonomous, is highly automated, and has a degree of artificial intelligence. It recognizes threats and responds to those threats accordingly. In service from 2011, Iron Dome is an Israeli anti-missile defense system designed to intercept and destroy incoming threats from ranges of four to 70 kilometers. 
Once it's activated, if there are multiple missiles approaching it, it will not wait for a human to give permission to fire on each one, it will simply fire on each incoming missile. The intelligence system is also advanced enough to recognize and ignore threats that will land on uninhabited areas, minimizing unnecessary interaction and overall costs. Underpinning further advances in autonomous weapon systems and artificial intelligence is another important development. One subcomponent of artificial intelligence is machine learning, which is based on the idea that a system can be programmed and taught to learn from a vast amount of data that that system is being fed with. The system learns to recognize certain patterns and generalized rules, and then draws conclusions from those patterns. The more the system learns, the better its performance becomes. And with increased performance comes speed. That allows very time-consuming things to be done now very quickly, possibly, you know, uh, processing at scale. The analogy that I use is like high-speed trading platforms on Wall Street. Artificial intelligence processes information and communication at rates no human being could ever hope to achieve. It's not people on the phone to their broker on the floor or a trader out on the trading floor trying to get them to buy or sell. But it's really kind of fundamentally just really advanced statistics, which sounds not all that exciting uh, until you kind of see it in action. These decisions are made in instantaneous split seconds by algorithms, by high-speed, high-volume trading platforms. The decisions about parameters for buying and selling and about what kinds of stocks are being targeted and what constitutes an event that's going to cause an algorithm to make a certain decision, all of that is set by humans and the policy parameters that it works within change and that's where the humans have their input. But in the moment, in the actual cycle of trading, it's happening in microseconds. In war, microseconds matter. They can mean the difference between life and death. In current technology, where there are humans out of the loop, it's in things like some of the defensive technologies we use around our capital assets. So we have machine guns that fire a very, very high rate of munitions to protect against an incoming missile onto a ship. That response, given the speed of the incoming missile, is automated. So it's coming in at Mach 1, and you've got three quarters of half of one second to make a decision. And with artificial intelligence powering ever faster systems that outstrip the capabilities of man, how far are we willing to go when delegating decisions to machines? In terms of offensive operations and strike, if it's an algorithm versus an algorithm where we automate the strike, and it's an algorithm versus a human, that's not warfare, that's something else. And we need to understand what that is. If we go so far as to automate our offensive strike processes, it's at odds with our understanding of the definition of warfare, which is an intimate human activity, and in my mind remains the case right now. Giving full autonomy to weaponized machines is shaping up to be a defining part of the discussion around future warfare. Fully autonomous implies fully capable decision-making by a machine. So a machine will decide what it's going to do, how it's going to do it, when it's going to do it. Do you just give them complete freedom to self-learn or do you put constraints on the self-learning? In a war capability, that is often assumed to be, well, if it's fully autonomous, it goes out and decides who to kill and who not to kill. How autonomous systems are going to make those decisions is probably the great challenge in artificial intelligence. There is still a human on the loop, but there's not a human in the loop. The policymaker or the commander, in a military sense, is going to be telling it which protocol to adopt. The air defense analogy, weapons tight, weapons hold, weapons free, they're all protocols. And the commander that says weapons free or weapons tight, they're basically putting forward a targeting policy that the system then works to. In 1983, at the height of the Cold War, the argument for keeping a human being on the loop could not have been made more profoundly. U.S. and Russia both had, you know, systems that were always on alert. There was a Russian, Petrov, 
who was monitoring sort of the systems and one day saw numerous missiles or indicators of missiles come up on screen. And um, it looked exactly like they were under attack by the U.S. Many of his colleagues are saying, I think we have to, we have to raise the flag. He would have had to notify his superiors and then he knew they would likely to a strike back. But for some reason, he just didn't think it was accurate. With apparent U.S. missiles raining down toward Russia, Petrov fell back on human instinct to make a calculated decision. He didn't think it made any sense that the Americans would be striking at that point, and so he decided not to elevate that decision. There was something that their systems were picking up in the atmosphere. Indeed, there weren't missiles, and so he basically saved us from, you know, a catastrophic outcome and a nuclear war. Defying protocol and declaring the system's indication of false alarm, Petrov's instinct-based decision prevented retaliatory nuclear strikes from NATO and U.S. forces. A nuclear war to end all wars was narrowly avoided. I think it highlights an important point here about human judgment. And I think anyone who's working in this, in this field or, or dealing with autonomy understands that there's something extremely special about human judgment that we don't expect machines to be able to replicate anytime soon, um, maybe ever. If human judgment is truly unique, the answer to maximizing the potential of artificially intelligent systems in future conflicts may not lie in removing humans from the loop completely, but instead, somewhere in between. The bond between human and machine has the potential to work with remarkable efficiency. Artificially intelligent systems communicating with highly trained soldiers, an unparalleled human-machine symbiosis. And the US Air Force right now has a program called Loyal Wingman, which involves an F-35 fighter with four to six drones that scout ahead of the manned aircraft that will carry out attacks in high threat environments, uh, will go and shoot down incoming threats or carry out attacks. The Loyal Wingman program utilizes swarming drones such as the Kratos Valkyrie XQ-58A. Their mission, to escort parent aircraft into the combat zone. Absorbing enemy fire when necessary, reaching speeds in excess of 1,000 kilometers an hour, and launching precision-guided bombs from a height of up to 45,000 feet, all in support of the human pilot. The pilot of the F-35 becomes more like an AWACS, an airborne warning and control aircraft, rather than a fighter aircraft. That's something that we haven't really seen before, where we're seeing a human and a machine teaming kind of shoulder to shoulder to generate a joint effect. Swarming drone programs, human-machine teaming, the contested space in future warfare moves toward the unmanned. DARPA's Gremlin program is partway through the development of a launch and retrieve system. Small weaponized drones, Gremlins, are launched by larger aircraft. Communication and navigation technology then inserts them into combat zones to overwhelm a target. Mission completed, these reusable systems then return to an out-of-combat zone parent aircraft. But the open sky is not the only domain for drones. Autonomous, unmanned warships using artificial intelligence navigate vast open seas and scour the ocean floor for submarines. Like in the aerial domain, distancing the human has benefits. It allows complex operations to continue in environments or on missions where it would almost be impossible to send a human uh, combatant into. The U.S. Navy is in the process of acquiring a series of drone warships, which are not small boats. DARPA's Sea Hunter, launched in 2016, is one of these. Capable of speeds of up to 27 knots with a transoceanic cruising range, 
Sea Hunter is a fully autonomous anti-submarine warfare ship. Medium-sized warships, which are uncrewed or optionally crewed, and can carry out most of the tasks that you would expect a manned warship to carry out, but do it in a much higher threat environment or in an environment where they're working in concert with a crewed ship. AIs give a couple of advantages. One, they don't involve having a single headquarters, which can be targeted or disrupted or its communications can be jammed, but rather the AI processing power will be sitting on every individual platform, so it'll be distributed amongst every asset in a drone swarm or every vehicle in a ground formation. The advantages that AI presents have set the stage for a global AI arms race. In warfare, the military that adopts new technology, that adapts new technology, always has an advantage, even if it's momentary. It's about 3500 BC, some metal worker came up with the copper mace. It's, you know, a stick with a ball of copper on the end. Not exactly what we would call high tech. The copper mace revolutionized war. Before you knew it, the people who had the copper mace at first, they went on to victory. But the people who were in their neighborhood who were fighting, the technology quickly spread, and before you knew it, everybody had copper maces. In future conflicts, artificial intelligence is the copper mace, the key to the next revolution. Though some, even those at the cutting edge of the technology industry, remain cautious. Elon Musk, for example, has been one of the local advocates warning of the danger of AI-enhanced robots defeating the human heart. He also stated that if one group or a small company of people will be capable of, at some point, developing a general AI, they will be the one to govern the rest of the world. In 2020, the U.S. released their Department of Defense budget proposal. In it, they requested close to a billion U.S. dollars to fund artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as almost four billion U.S. dollars to fund unmanned and autonomous projects. As militaries around the world hone in on the potential of artificial intelligence, visions of a first wave of robotic combatants being sent across a kill zone or many small killer drones swarming a target come to mind. But that is not the immediate future of warfare. And to a non-educated or a non-professional person looking at a future military in, say, 2030, it may not look superficially that much different from what we see now, but it may have precision and firepower and surveillance reach and processing speed and cyber kinetic capabilities that you would only dream of now. It'll require a different rethink on how we fight with perhaps additional new technologies at the periphery. But the sunk cost in what we already have is not gonna go away for you know, 50 years. So we're gonna have to learn how to play with a lot with what we already have. The fusion of intelligence and information with opportunity through a machine that can understand and process information at a rate far quicker than humans will be decisive in achieving military advantage in the next big war. An event or series of events in 2018 illustrate the controversies around developing AI for weapon systems. The United States Department of Defense put out a call to industry offering funding for a company or companies to develop technology that would enable, say, a drone to recognize people or items on the ground, categorize them, classify them, and potentially target them, all without human input. Partnering with Google, the U.S. Department of Defense sought to improve the efficiency of information processing. 
Project Maven was born. So in the context of Project Maven, based on the collective experiences of US military operations since the attacks of September 11, 2001, and the advent of drones, specifically in the context of intelligence collection and surveillance, the product of all that was a potentially unlimited amount of full motion video, much of it high definition, that still needed to be processed by humans in terms of being able to differentiate across that motion video between friend and foe. It's cognitive overload, really, is the situation we're living in now. The uh, drones are collecting not just uh, imagery, but all kinds of SIGINT. So you just have this massive pile of data coming in 24-7 from the aerial collection platforms, and there is no way to process it all. They are trying to adapt the artificial intelligence program so that they can readily sift out the useful bits and do the work that the human analysts have done. At the operational level, uh, the ability to process data uh, at large scale, at speed, really helps in areas of intelligence and logistics and operations. Maven sought to provide an algorithm to assign to each object. A computer could distill one algorithm, which could be a car, from another algorithm, which could be a person which is about developing facial recognition software, autonomous facial recognition software. So what might take hours, if not weeks, of analysis across hundreds or thousands of hours of continuous looped video could instead be filtered in a millisecond. That's Project Maven. But an existential crisis was brewing within the corridors of Google. Word was out that Google was involved in an AI program with the Pentagon. Google workers were concerned that their work interpreting video imagery using AI would contribute to improving drone strike targeting. 3,000 Google employees wrote to the senior management and said, we are not happy that Google is involved with the US Department of Defense Project Maven. And so you can see now why AI is so attractive a proposition for the military. But also for countries want to insist on using the state as a way to monitor and surveil their own population, it provides a similar sort of opportunity. So if you could have an algorithm for every human being in a country when they're born, you could conceivably track them through an AI system in the physical sense for the rest of their life. Orwellian, but true. And certainly AI could provide the facility for that going forward. Deciding not to renew their contract with the US Department of Defense, Google updated their previous motto, don't be evil, to do the right thing. Before Project Maven and before drones scoured the ground below for intelligence, it was the aircraft of the First World War that were initially used for reconnaissance missions flying over combat zones, photographing their enemy's position, and mapping the zigzag of trenches below. The reconnaissance pilots of earlier wars also realized another advantage of being in the sky above their target, distance. From sword fighting to spear throwing to firing arrows, right through to artillery, then aerial bombing, and now to drones that can be piloted across continents. There has been this physical distancing uh, between the, the shooter and the target. Killing from a distance, though, has always bred complications for the soldier. Future warfare combatants won't be flying low over trenches. They could very well be operating drones from a control room in Las Vegas, Nevada, engaging with personnel in another state or country following orders from a base anywhere on the planet. I don't think anyone wants a situation where we are sort of very emotionally detached and not thinking and reflecting on our actions and just going to war and pressing buttons. And the term PlayStation Killer was brought about early in the 21st century to describe this expectation that it would be somehow just like playing a game. It's always the notion that we're just going to be pressing a button and going back and sitting on your couch, right? And you've blown something up. 
In the 1920s, the world's major powers came together to discuss banning the dropping of bombs from aircraft. They were concerned that killing from a distance was dehumanizing and unethical. The physical distance has got vast, but the psychological, visual distance, the emotional distance, has shrunk right back down to World War I or even pre-World War I levels. I call it the distance paradox. Physical distance has grown, visual, emotional, psychological distance has shrunk right back down to that of the early days of war. If you look at the use of drones and drone footage, some operators have never been closer. They're seeing things in HD. Psychological trauma is rife throughout the military sector. Drone operators are not exempt from it. At the end of that shift, go home to their families and try to conduct normal life for 12 hours with a partner, with children, with friends, before going back and doing the same the next day. In future conflicts, artificial intelligence might provide an opportunity for human emotion to be taken out of a kill equation if authority to make that kill was delegated to a machine. So whether it is desirable to remove human emotions from the battlefield or not through the use of technologies is an interesting question. People assume that the fact that certain actions are delegated means there's, a, there's an emotional distance or psychological distance. The responsibility for the actions of machines cannot be delegated to machines, but will uh, remain with humans. If debate in past wars focused on the ethics of dropping bombs from a distance, today's debate concerns embedding ethics into artificially intelligent machines. Let me give you a real human example. A police officer may have rules which prohibit him or her from diving into a river to rescue a member of the public who is drowning. The result of that rule might be that a civilian dies. How do you program that ability to flick between one ethical approach and another ethical approach in machines I think the ability to do that is one of the things that defines us as human beings. And I'm not convinced that a machine any time in my lifetime will be able to do that in the same way as a human. And there's one further dimension, and that is, I think if a human gets it wrong, a policeman jumps in the, the river and drowns, or somebody like that makes such a decision, I think the general public will be understanding of human error. But if a computer is making a decision which costs a human life, even if a human would make exactly the same decision and cost the exact same human life, I suspect culturally part of being human is we will accept the human error before we will accept the robot error. We want to interrogate the legal and ethical and moral elements of that construct and make sure that it does actually fit with our values and with who we are and how we want to operate in the space. When autonomous systems act and maybe target whether civilians or combatants, who is responsible for the consequences, whether positive or negative consequences? The question is whether we want these technologies to make decisions which are matters of life and death and are ethically loaded. Some people may say ethics is a purely human affair, and that's why humans should always be in control of technologies. I think if we can have this constant dialogue, then technology will hopefully evolve at the same time or only fractionally ahead of the ethical issues, ethical concerns and legal concerns. It's important for us to think about the ways in which our existing ethical principles can still be applied, even in worlds that are quite different from the world in which we live now. If the legal considerations and the ethical considerations, which is about is it right rather than is it legal, we're more likely, I hope, as, as a human race, to work our way through in a way that does not become overwhelmingly harmful or out of control. There's some who would say, 
Dignity matters no matter what. That's the primary objective. And therefore, if a machine is killing and there's not a human operator in the loop, that's undignified. By removing the human emotion, we are going to lose both of them. We're going to lose all the negative emotions, such as fear, but also emotions which could also be creating positive cultures, such as empathy. Part of that dilemma between accepting human error and machine error, I think are human emotions like empathy. Because if I make a grave error that costs a life, no matter how painful it is for the family, and I may even go to court and jail depending on what I've done, if I have a full range of human emotions, then it's likely that I'm going to suffer in some way internally, guilt, conscience. But a machine does not have guilt or conscience or empathy those factors are some of the reasons why people will not accept a machine error quite so readily as they would accept a human error. The fear that artificially intelligent, weaponized machines, robots, will rise up and take over is as palpable today as it was in the age of antiquity. When Greek mythology told of the bronze automaton, Talos, created by Greek gods to protect a Cretan princess. Science fiction and popular culture has influenced discussions around AI and particularly drones for at least the better part of a decade that I've been personally involved in public debate around this. And early on in the debate, some years ago, the accusations were, well, drones, they're just one step to these automatic killing machines, and people who've seen science fiction films like The Terminator or other early films like that have argued that it is inevitable that machines will take control of themselves, they'll have no regard for human life, and they will just be on the run, on the loose, causing devastation. It's funny in a way, we don't have many actual fielded systems to point to, or the ones that we do, the implementation of autonomy is, is not readily visible or it's not all that exciting. So the reference set that people pull from is what they see on, on TV or in the movies. And that can be scary and exciting, but it's really often unfounded. Groups such as the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots have pushed for United Nations action to ban the development, production, and use of lethal autonomous weapon systems. Formed in 2012, their stance has been that fully autonomous weapons cross a moral threshold, and that it is important to retain human control over the use of force. In 2015, an open letter from the group warned of the dangers of lethal autonomous weapons stating that if any major military power pushes ahead with AI weapon development, a global arms race is virtually inevitable. Over 4,000 AI and robotics researchers signed the letter, as did public figureheads of the scientific community, such as Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Steve Wozniak. I have news for you. The robots are not taking over the world. There are those who would definitely advocate for an outright ban on any kind of robotic technology. I look at history. In the 1920s, the major powers of the world came together to discuss the banning of bombing from aircraft, but it didn't happen. It would be similar to saying we should ban locomotive engines, right? Because we know that in the future, they'll be used to transport troops all over Europe and to do all kinds of horrible things in war. And I think there will not be a ban on, on what's called killer robots for the same reason, because they are militarily useful and they are definitely economically useful if you take the civilian applications. And so I'm, I'm doubtful about a ban. So the best thing is, how do we limit the harms, both in war and in peace? My big worry would be that technologists simply rush ahead, develop, frankly, barbaric capabilities, and then think, oh, should we constrain this in some way? It's 
hard. Testing and evaluate these systems are, are challenging. So I don't think we'd want to use a system that we couldn't evaluate to some level of confidence. And then there's the notion of trust that to me is one that's more psychological or um, emotional. We trust, we trust the, the adoption, adoption of, of these systems, systems into our lives, lives, or we have operators who trust that they're going to develop relationships. If you look at the human machine team and how that relationship develops, that's about trust, about like, I believe this system's going to behave the way it did in the previous times I interacted with it. In a military context, artificial intelligence is all about controlled precision, the antithesis of robots going rogue. But in reality, you want to maintain control and commanders have no interest really in losing control of how they conduct operations. That's a big misconception that AI is, is about losing control. I think you can have autonomy in a system that actually is not about you losing control, but actually maintaining more control maybe. Militaries have a term called command and control, and that's literally what it is. It is the attempt to control complexity, to control violence, to achieve an end. In many ways, one of the ironies of this larger debate is an assumption by various campaigns or groups that want to ban AI-enabled weapon systems. They have this ingrained assumption that militaries want to have an uncontrollable capability, which really just doesn't make any sense to folks who actually work with the military. There's a desire and a, a strong push to maintain effective control, because that's how you achieve your political ends. What is warfare? Is it still the classic definition of blood being shed, people being killed, and humans fighting you know, intimately and personally with each other? Or is it a more broader understanding of the use of autonomous systems fighting in what I would call a robotics engagement zone? We sort of imagine, um, you know, war fighting robots, right? It's, it's clear that lots of people might have emotional, but possibly also reasoned ethical arguments for why that would be problematic, but that is, is not the AI of the present, that's the AI of some future that may or may not come to be. In terms of where war is headed in the future, certain things will remain the same. People will still be central in war, but there will be more technology. Artificial intelligence is coming, but I don't see it as a silver bullet. It's not the panacea. We're just gonna have to become very clever and think much harder in how we leverage these new technologies with the old to come up with a fighting system that provides us with what we need, but also know that as soon as we deploy it, within days, it's gonna be obsolete and we're gonna have to do it all over again. Artificial intelligence is part of the emerging revolutionary technologies that are transforming future warfare. That transformation will be profound. The character of war forever altered. The fourth industrial revolution really is the hyper-connectivity that is being fostered through society, through commerce, through military institutions. Disruptive technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, robotics, Generation 2 space-based capabilities, material sciences, synthetic technologies are very much changing not just the nature of national security activities and, and military operations, but they're changing the globe. Just as we saw in the first industrial revolution where steam changed the world, these technologies literally are changing the world around us and they're changing the world at a pace that we have not seen for a very long time. Change is coming. It will be driven by artificial intelligence. It is up to humanity to keep pace with it so that together we decide our future. The big challenge and the big lesson is if there is to be more technology, if there's to be more artificial intelligence, that we need to keep the human in there somewhere because without the human in war, it truly becomes inhuman. And that is a future that we should all want to avoid. <laughs>